Welcome back everybody. So today we're going to continue our discussion of the digestive system by looking at the structure function relationships in the second part of the alimentary canal. So as a reminder, previously we talked about how food comes into the alimentary canal or the GI tract through the mouth, down through the esophagus, which is part of that GI tract, and then enters the stomach. And now we're going to talk about the intestines, the largest percentage of which are the small intestines. Um, and how they're involved and structurally specialized for both breaking down food and digesting it, but also absorbing it from the uh, external cavity, which is inside the body, namely the inside of the alimentary canal, and how the food moves from that interior space, gets broken down within the intestine, intestinal lumen, and then is absorbed through the walls of the intestines into the blood vessels in the lymphatic system where ultimately they can be circulated to body cells. Let's start by reviewing the digestive processes that underlie the function of the digestive system in which nutrients and minerals are absorbed into the body so they can be used by body cells. Food, when it's taken in through the mouth, needs to be transported throughout the continuous tube or the GI tract all the way to the rectum and then anything that the body doesn't want is ultimately excreted in feces. So as a reminder, feces, while they go through the inside of the body, are never actually internal because this lumen or the opening in the GI tract is technically continuous with the external space. As this food moves through, um, the goal of the body is to absorb it and move it into the body. And in order for that to happen, it needs to be moved into the bloodstream. So things need to be microscopic. And those things are the macronutrients, the vitamins, and the minerals. In order for them to be microscopic so that the body can actually absorb them, the food has to be broken down, both mechanically, so physically separated, and also chemically digested, namely larger molecules that are chemically bonded together need to have those atomic bonds broken via enzymes, which allows them to create uh, microscopic particles that can be absorbed in the gut. So as a reminder, this is a diagram of a protein where we have our normal protein structure. It's folded up in these interactions, namely hydrogen bonds, or kind of hiding some of the atomic bonds or preventing ac easy access to these interior spaces. And so this process of digestion involves mechanically breaking, breaking them down. In the case of a protein, breaking these hydrogen bonds so the protein can be unfolded and the enzymes which are chemically digesting the <clears throat> protein uh, represented by the scissors here actually break these atomic bonds and break the molecule down into smaller pieces and the continuous activity of enzymes eventually breaks down this one large molecule this one continuous protein into multiple small monomers um, or individual amino acid molecules, which can then be, are small enough to be transported and absorbed into the body. In our discussion of the intestines, we're really gonna focus on the process of absorption and also chemical digestion, because these are the two primary digestive processes that are occurring in the intestines, or the ones that are really unique to the intestines, which we haven't talked about already. So before we get to that, I want to quickly review the principles of absorption, which hopefully you've seen in previous biology classes. So the idea of absorption is that these molecules, these nutrients, um, macronutrients, and vitamins and minerals need to be transported from outside of the body through the lipid bilayer of the cells, some cells of the body, specifically epithelial cells, because those are forming the lining, into the cell proper, and then ultimately uh, transported into the bloodstream so they can be circulated to other cells. You'll note that there are a few different types of nutrients and molecules here, and so I've represented them and I have a key on the right, um, and we'll talk about how these individually are transported. So the key thing to note is that absorption is driven by molecular transport processes. And so this is where GenBio should immediately ring a bell. So there's two different ways that things can be transported. The first one is passive, which involves diffusion, where molecules are simply moving down their concentration gradient and kind of bouncing around. And the second one requires energy, and that's active transport, where either a molecule has to be moved uh, against its concentration gradient or it needs some extra energy in order to get through the membrane. Because this membrane, as you'll remember, is amphiopathic, which means that 
part of the membrane is charged or hydrophilic, so water loving. Um, and so these are the phospholipids right here. And then the core of the plasma membrane is nonpolar. It has these lipid tails. And so these don't like to interact with charge. So charged molecules can't easily move through this membrane because they don't want to interact with this nonpolar core that's very energetically unfavorable. So again, diffusion is passive, so it doesn't require energy investment. So most things, when they're moving down their concentration gradient um, from high concentration to low concentration, will simply move um, due to random motion and diffuse across the membrane. However, there are factors that are limiting diffusion, and one I just mentioned is polarity or charge separation within the molecule. So if we looked at our diagram here, we can see this group on the left is composed of charged or polar molecules. In this case, this includes carbohydrates, uh, amino acids, and also our minerals, so sodium, chloride, and potassium here. On the other hand, nonpolar molecules like lipids, triglycerides, or nonpolar amino acids are not going to have the same difficulty moving through this nonpolar core of the membrane because they're not charged and so there's not an unfavorable energetic uh, interaction as they're trying to move from that membrane. And as a reminder, these are nonpolar, so they're already in water, which is polar itself. So that's an unfavorable interaction. So they'll naturally want to move to an area where they're more protected or not interacting with that charge. So even though the phospholipid bilayer, one side of the bio or th the two sides of the bilayer, the surfaces of the bilayer are negatively charged, they're also interacting with water, which itself is charged. However, just because a molecule is nonpolar doesn't mean that it can easily th move through the membrane. So one of the things that will limit the movement will be the size of the molecule. Um, so for instance, an amino acid may not easily move through the membrane because it's relatively large or a protein won't, even if it's nonpolar, where something like a triglyceride might be able to embed in the membrane due to the interactions or because it's smaller, although triglycerides can be pretty big themselves. The other thing that limits diffusion and which is the key driver is concentration. So remember, things move down their concentration gradient. So in this case, if we have more sodium on the outside, there's going to be more driving force for sodium to want to move in um, because of the concentration. There's lots of them outside. And so remember, the idea of diffusion is these molecules eventually will settle on equal mixing. And so we can think of that unequal mixing is effectively driving this molecular movement. The factors I just discussed were really properties of the molecules themselves, so I uh, identify them as molecular factors. The other thing that we can consider when we're thinking about uh, transport, specifically diffusion or passive transport, are environmental factors. And so I'm using environmental in a very general sense, but these are two of them. So one of them is permeability. So for instance, these sodiums can't move across the membrane because again, they're charged in the core of the membrane is nonpolar. So they're not gonna easily move through this membrane. However, if there is a channel or some other uh, structure in the membrane which will allow sodium to move through, then that will increase the permeability of the membrane to that molecule and allow it to move passively across that membrane. In this case, sodium would move down its concentration gradient. There's lots of sodium on the outside. And in this image, there's no sodium on the inside. The other thing that will influence it, uh, which we've discussed quite frequently in the past two units is surface area. So if we think about transport occurring across the membrane, then the more membrane there is, the more potential there is for transport. So that surface area is really critical to allowing for very rapid uh, and uh, massive transport because it allows for more overall transport. Some other factors that we've discussed um, and partly um, in the respiratory system is temperature, especially if we're thinking of gases. So the higher the temperature, um, both in gases and liquids, the more energetic the molecules are, the more they're bouncing around. So we can kind of think of that similar to surface area. So surface area means there's more area for interaction and temperature, which increases molecular interactions or bouncing around means there's more opportunities because things are moving faster. So they tend to collide or move more quickly. So they have more opportunities within the same period of time to move through that membrane. Pressure is kind of the same idea. If we increase pressure, again, we 
constrict the area. And so we're again, increasing those molecular interactions. So for instance, when we talked about the respiratory system, um, the higher the pressure, the easier it was for oxygen to be absorbed because it was being pushed more. Um, and so that led to more interactions of the oxygen and more potential oxygen being um, moved into the bloodstream. The final environmental factor is energy specifically in the form of uh, chemical energy within a solution or within a cell that powers active transport. Um, and so this involves ATP generally, which is the energy currency of the cell, or some sort of gradient, for instance, a sodium gradient. So here I have an example of, this is active transport now, of a, a, a carbohydrate being transported into the cell. And so carbohydrates are large, they move through transport proteins, but they're large enough that it requires some energy in order to get it through the membrane. And so the way the body harnesses or uses energy is it actually uses sodium in the form of a battery. So sodium is highly concentrated outside, so it wants to move in, that's energetically favorable. So it's effectively storing energy because sodium will naturally move in. And so in order to get this carbohydrate in, um, the body can use the energy stored in the sodium gradient to power the transport of something like a carbohydrate or an amino acid into the body. And in fact, a lot of transport in the body is not directly driven by ATP. So it's not a transport molecule that's using ATP to move things directly across the membrane. A lot of it involves co-transports where the movement of an, a charged ion down its concentration gradient actually pulls other larger molecules with it and provides the power to do that. Um, another way you can think about that is when we have the flow of charged substances that's creating current. So effectively, these sodium molecules are providing electricity in order to power the transport of these larger macromolecules. Now that we've reviewed those principles of absorption, we can look and investigate how the structure of the GI tract um, is effectively adapted or structured around those limitations or requirements for absorption and how it's specialized to overcome different um, barriers to absorption, whether it's size or whether it's the chemical properties like the polarity or the lack of polarity um, in order to get things from inside the lumen of the GI tract into the actual uh, cells and blood vessels that are lining the GI tract. So as a reminder, the GI tract is this tube. Um, and so throughout the GI tract from the esophagus all the way down to the anus, the general structure of that GI tract or that tube is the same. Um, and so there are four layers. Um, so if we go from the lumen or the interior of the tube, the first layer is the mucosa, which includes the epithelial lining, which is actually interacting with the food. And then the submucosa, which has a lot of different things, including the larger blood vessels and the nervous uh, innervation. Then we have the muscularis, which includes the muscles which actually move things around the gut and are involved in transporting food. And finally, we have the serosa, which is the outer layer, which is kind of lubricated and protecting that tube. As we go through the tube, while the structure, the general structure is the same, there is lots of variation in this, uh, in some of these structures as we look at different parts of the alimentary canal. So one example of this is the epithelium of the mucosa in the stomach versus the intestine. And I discussed this in my previous lecture where the stomach has these pits. And as a reminder, the reason the stomach has the pits is it's secreting acid into the lumen of the stomach. And so that acid can damage cells. So by uh, creating these pits, it uh, effectively protects these deeper cells that are producing the acid. And then there's the layer of mucus on top, which then uh, neutralizes the acid before it can potentially damage the cells. Um, the intestines, on the other hand, rather than having these deep pits to protect the cells from the acidic environment, the intestine is more involved in absorption. And so in this process of absorption, the intestine actually wants things to move into the body and into the bloodstream. So it wants to interact with the contents in the lumen as much as possible. And so the intestine has these specialized structures that increase the surface area. So specifically these villi and then the microvilli on the individual cells. Um, and these villi are actually projecting into the tube. So they're kind of like fleshy hairs 
that are lining the tube rather than these deep pits. And so as you might imagine, it's harder for things to get into the deep pits than it is for stuff to just surround these fleshy hairs. So as I've already stated, the structure of the different digestive organs, uh, and in this case, the different parts of the alimentary canal, really reflect their functions and their demands. Um, and so if we look at the GI tract, we can look at these later stages after the stomach, specifically the small intestine, and then the large intestine, and then the anus here, and we can look at the uh, functions that are occurring in those different areas. So note that as with all parts of the GI tract, all of them are involved in transport, and that's primarily going to be a muscular process. Um, and then uh, if we look here, the small intestine is also involved in chemical digestion and mechanical breakdown. And then this new function that we haven't talked about as much, which is absorption. Um, and so the small intestine is composed of three different parts, and we'll talk about each of these individually, um, the duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum. And then as we get into the large intestine, note that the large intestine, which is at the end of the alimentary canal, so it's the last stage effectively before secretion, um, the large intestine is involved in really just propulsion or movement and absorption. So there's not any digestion really taking place this late in the intestine. And finally, the anus is just getting rid of every, everything that the body doesn't want. It's not involved in any absorption. In addition to the GI tract, there are also a number of accessory organs that are supporting the function of the intestines, specifically the pancreas, which is involved in secreting enzymes, which assist in chemical digestion. So here we have the first section of the tube, the duodenum right here of the small intestine, sorry. And here is the pancreas. And so the pancreas is secreting digestive enzymes into the duodenum to help in this process of chemical digestion. In addition, we have both the liver and the gallbladder. Um, and so in terms of digestive function, both the liver and the gallbladder are playing a role in mechanical digestion through the production of bile. And we'll talk about that a little later. And so one of the things I really want to highlight here is that these late G parts of the GI tract are really specialized for absorption because we didn't see that, that as much in the esophagus and the stomach. And so this is really where the rubber hits the road and things move from the interior of the lumen and get into the body, hit the bloodstream and get to the cells of your body. In today's lecture, I'm really going to focus on the small intestine because it's really uh, the most complicated and the most interesting. Um, and uh, I'll talk about the large intestine and the anus later, although I really want to focus in terms of overall concepts on the small intestine. And related to that, the accessory organs, the pancreas, liver, and gallbladder that are secreting things into the small intestine to help with these functions. And so the small intestine especially is uh, specialized for absorption. However, before we talk about the intestines proper, we have to talk about the last organ we talked about, which was the stomach, which is where we left things, where the stomach was mixing things up and producing this chyme, um, which is a mix of the gastric juices in the food. And so this chyme is really acidic. Remember, it's full of HCl, which is produced by the lining of the stomach. And so it has a very low pH. Um, and so, uh, that it's highly acidic, has a pH approximately of two, and remember neutral pH is about seven. And so if this chyme were to get to the small intestine um, and not be processed or neutralized, it could potentially damage that intestinal tissue because this highly acidic solution uh, is actually very damaging to cells. And so this requires some sort of control in the amount of chyme that is released and neutralization of the stomach acids, which is controlled via this pyloric sphincter, which is creating this junction between the stomach, the pylorus of the stomach, and the first part of the small intestine, the duodenum. And so one of the things I'll just highlight here is you can see this, this mucus lining the duodenum, which is very important. That mucus is important because it's alkaline or basic, so it has a high pH. And so you'll note that the pH of the stomach is very low, and then the mucus in the duodenum or the small intestine 
is has a high pH, so it's very high. So when we mix those together, the alkaline and the acidic, what we're going to get is something more neutral that isn't going to damage that intestinal tissue. So uh, this duodenum, uh, the cells in the duodenum and also the pancreas to some extent produce this alkaline mucus, which is released within the duodenum or the small intestine prior to the chyme being released from the stomach into the intestines. So effectively, this mucus creates a buffer so that when the acid is released, um, it neutralizes the acidic chyme, and then that can be processed. So this uh, process of release of mucus is actually triggered by hormones and paracrine signals, for instance, gastrin that's released in the, from the stomach cells, um, and that basically signals to the small intestine, get prepared for chyme to come. Um, and, and so there's incoming acid, and so you'd better prepare for it. And so this is really an example of a short reflex. What's going on in the stomach is communicated to the small intestine. So as the stomach feel, fills, it will release signals like gastrin, which the small intestine can then sense and use that signal to prepare for the contents of the stomach emptying into the small intestine. So once the stomach is mixed up and ready to release that chyme, this occurs through these sequential waves of peristalsis. So as remember, as a reminder, peristalsis is the sequential contraction of mus muscle, which effectively pinches and squeezes and moves. So imagine squeezing toothpaste out of a toothpaste tube. Um, and so as that peristaltic wave travels across the stomach and pushes this chyme, this pyloric sphincter, uh, forming the junction between the stomach and the small intestine opens and a little bit of chyme is pushed into the small intestine and then neutralized by this alkaline or basic mucus within the small intestine. After this peristaltic wave arrives, the pyloric sphincter actually closes. So note that we have this propagating wave of activity and muscle activation. So once it hits the sphincter, which is composed of muscle itself, it's going to activate that muscle and cause it to contract. So it's naturally going to close that sphincter before too much chyme gets through. And so this stomach chyme kind of bounces around and will continue to churn in here as small bits of chyme are released into the small intestine um, so that it can be uh, kind of flow through that du duodenum and be processed. Note that I'm showing air here, but really this should be almost a completely full tube here. So as that stomach chyme is released into the duodenum, that chyme is really just mainly the food mixed with hydrochloric acid and other gastric secretions, but that food hasn't really been absorbed. Not much has been absorbed within the stomach. And so it's mainly the food with some extra stuff in it. And so that means that anything that the body wants needs to be broken down small enough that it can be absorbed. And so that is the intestine, the job of the small intestines in particular, which are finishing the chemical digestion of breaking down um, the food particles in the chyme and then ultimately absorbing or transporting that into the body. So here we can see uh, these, uh, if we imagine this as a protein which has been broken down in the stomach by pepsin, so it's cut into this, these oligomers. Um, and so now the role of the small intestine is going to be using more enzymes to chop this protein up into the ind individual amino acids, which are small enough to actually be transported and moved through the, uh, epi uh, the plasma membrane of the epithelial cells lining the small intestine and then ultimately into the body. And so in order for this to occur, there are a few specializations of the small intestine. So one thing you'll note is that the small intestine is very, very long. It takes up a lot of space in here and it's this very long tube. That length allows a lot of time for these chemical reactions to occur to break down these molecules, whether they're proteins or carbohydrates or lipids, small enough that they can be absorbed. Um, and so there's a lot of time for breaking down and absorption in this tube. The other thing we observe is in the small intestine, there's a huge increase in surface area of the epithelium that's interacting with the lumen of the tube and the contents of that. And that increase in interaction allows for more absorption and effectively faster absorption because uh, there's more surface area to react. And so there's more absorption occurring per section of the intestine. So everything is moving a lot faster than it would if it was just kind of a normal flat line tube. 
So I've just highlighted this function absorption. And so now let's look at the structures of the intestines that support this rapid absorption, namely in the form of surface area. So there are actually multiple levels of anatomical specialization in the small intestine that are increasing this surface area. So the first thing is that if we look at the larger shape of the intestine, there are these large circular folds. Um, and so you can see how there's kind of this folding in the wall of the intestines. Um, and so these grooves are kind of a uh, rough surface means that there's more overall surface to interact with the food in the tubule. And so these circular folds are very large. If you were to cut the small intestine of your mink open and look inside of it, you would actually see kind of this rugged surface inside the intestine, which reflects the circular folds, which are increasing surface area. So if we zoom in on this fold right here, we can see that there's an additional uh, specialization at the tissue level. So circular fold is really at the level of the organ, the whole small intestine. And now we're zooming in on a small section and we're looking kind of at the level of the tissue. Um, and so here, when we look at this, we can see these things called villi or fingers uh, that are going out into the lumen of the tubule. So this is the lumen right here. And then this is inside the body. You can see the blood and lymphatic vessels in here. And so you can see the epithelium is actually creating this large finger-like structure going down and up. And so rather than just a flat surface, we have these large projections going into the lumen of the tubule, which are increasing the surface area. And so this larger structure, and so note that these are all individual cells, so it's composed of multiple different cells from this line, uh, lining, is called a villus, singular, or villi if we're talking plural. Finally, if we zoom in on the individual cells, that are composing this villus right here, we can see that at the cell level, we have another specialization that increases surface area, which are the microvilli. So think of micro fingers here. Um, and so these are little projections that are of the plasma membrane of the cell that are now projecting into the lumen of the intestine. Um, and this is also called the brush border because it kind of looks like a paintbrush or a broom on the surface of these cells. And usually if you look at it through a microscope, it's really fuzzy um, because it's so small that it can't be resolved effectively um, with a light microscope. But we've talked about now these three levels of specialization. We have circular folds, villi, and microvilli. And so we effectively have three times the surface area as opposed to if we just had a flat surface in the intestine. Let's focus a little more on the cells that compose the small intestine because there are a few different cell types all helping to serve different functions um, and uh, requirements for the internal lining of the intestine. So the first and most common type of cell are the enterocytes, also known as the absorptive cells, which as their name suggests, are involved in absorbing um, nutrients. And so these are the most uh, numerous. So if we zoom in here on our absorptive cells on this villus right here, we can see that they form kind of this continuous wall here. Um, and so the food is going to be on the outside. And then on the inside is going to be the internal part of the body, the interstitium, uh, in which the capillaries and lymphatic vessels are present. Those lymphatic vessels are termed lacteals. Um, and so these are collecting things that are absorbed and bringing it into circulation. These enterocytes have a few important specializations. So the first, and hopefully you remember this from both general biology and a &P one is that they have these specialized junctions that connect cells called tight junctions. So as a reminder, tight junctions, you can think of them as zippers that are connecting or zip it, zipping the two plasma membranes of the cell together. Um, and so effectively what that does is when you push the plasma membrane together, there's no space in between. So it prevents things from moving um, uh, between the cells into the body. Uh, and so these are really important in the intestines because they allow the cells then to regulate what gets into the body. And so things aren't going to slip in between the walls. So you can see I've added the tight junctions right here. And so these tight junctions are creating one kind of continuous membrane, uh, plasma membrane along the lining of the intestine. Um, and so the cells themselves are really controlling what's coming into the body. 
We discussed this already, but if we zoom in on these cells, then we see the microvilli or the brush border on the surface, which is increasing that surface area for absorption. The other thing these enterocytes do is they secrete intestinal juices, particularly in these intestinal crypts down here. Um, and so as they secrete that, um, that helps um, sort of lubricate the in, insides of the intestine um, and also sometimes has have things that can interact with the contents of the lumen. Um, and again, the microvilli can help in this because the more surface area, not only is there more surface for things from to move out to in, but there's more surface area for actual secretion. Finally, a really important specialization of these enterocytes is that they have enzymes on the microvilli or the brush border. And so these enzymes are actually interacting with the contents of the intestine. And so as a reminder, these enzymes are breaking chemical bonds. And so the more surface area, the more enzymes can be present. So note if it was just flat, effectively we'd have one, two, three enzymes right here, but because we have this villus structure, the microvillus here, um, we have more space for enzymes. And so each of these enzymes can catalyze reactions and break down the chemical bonds between food um, and help that process of chemical digestion go even faster. The next type of cell are the goblet cells. And so these goblet cells, you can see we've zoomed in on this orange cell right here, which is kind of, they're kind of interspersed between these enterocytes. So these goblet cells are uh, playing an important role because they're producing mucus, specifically alkaline mucus in the duodenum, which helps neutralize that chyme, that acidic chyme that's coming from the stomach. This mucus is also involved in lubrication um, and kind of the alkalinity of the mucus can also protect the intestinal walls from digestive enzymes that are in the lumen of the intestine. So just like the stomach, you don't necessarily want your enzymes, which are breaking down macromolecules to interact with the cells of the lining, because if they do, they could damage things on the surface of the cell because the cells are themselves composed of macromolecules. Um, so these goblet cells are there to produce this mucus. Finally, there are endocrine cells that produce regulatory hormones. I already talked about gastrin, which is regulating the interaction between the stomach and the intestine, but there's also a bunch of hormones in the intestines which regulate motility or secretion and timing of different digestive and absorptive processes. And last but not least are these granular panneth cells, which are involved in immune and protection. So often all of your epithelial tissues, especially ones that are interacting with the external environment, like your intestines. So remember the in contents of uh, your gut uh, and the stuff in that lumen is really directly from outside. And so your cells are interacting with stuff from outside. And so there are potentially damaging or pathogenic stuff in that material and so your body wants to be protected and so these granular panneth cells are really providing that uh, cellular level protection and molecular level. So we talked about these three specializations of the small intestine, the circular folds, the villi, and the microvilli for increasing surface area for absorption, but ultimately stuff that's absorbed needs to be moved into the bloodstream so it can be circulated throughout the body. And so the other thing you'll note about the small intestines is that they're heavily vascularized. There's lots of capillaries in here, um, which are absorbing the proteins and the carbohydrates and getting that into the blood, bloodstream. And also these lacteals, which are the lymphatic vessels. Um, and so these just kind of end there. And so remember the lymphatic system is just kind of absorbing that interstitial fluid rather than being part of the closed circulatory system where blood is flowing from the arterial to the venous end of the capillaries, the lacteal is just kind of blind ended and then everything is being collected and moved to the heart. And so fats are being absorbed by the lacteals and then all of that stuff is actually gonna come together. Um, and you can also see on the bottom here, kind of different micrographs of the different levels of the intestine. So again, these are the circular folds right here. So note that we have these kind of, uh, they look like waves in the tissue right here. And then you'll see there's these fingers on top of the waves. So those are the villi. So if we zoom in, we can see the villi right here. Um, so if we look, we can see that there's individual cells which are composing the membrane or, or composing the lining of the villus. And then if we were to zoom in on these individual cells 
and this is now an electron microscope image because it's so small we can actually see these finger-like projections coming from the cell which are the microvilli or the brush border um, in this idea of the brush border you can kind of see here where the lining of these villi looks kind of fuzzy and that's because these little fingers are so small that they just make everything look fuzzy and they're hard to see so now let's look at the different segments of the small intestine because they have slightly different functions or specializations. And we'll also look at the properties of the uh, histological structure or the microstructure of these uh, different parts of the intestine. So you can kind of use this for, for both lab, but see how we can differentiate them. So the first section is the duodenum. And so this is relatively short. You can see it in purple here and is coming right after the stomach. So this is really the primary site for digestion and absorption. A lot of the digestive processes, the chemical digestion uh, start here. Um, and a lot of that initial breakdown is achieved in this first segment. And also a lot of absorption is going on because this is going to be very nutrient, mineral and vitamin rich. And so uh, those things uh, through passive diffusion and kind of the energy gradients will be easier to absorb and easy to absorb right away. Um, so the duodenum, in addition to doing uh, digestion and absorption also has a few other functions. So it's closest to the stomach. So it's the part of the small intestine that is responsible for neutralizing the incoming chyme from the stomach. And so it actually has these special structures there called these Brunner's glands, which are secreting that alkaline mucus to really neutralize the stomach acid because you need lots of it in the duodenum. So if we look at our micrograph over here, again, we can see uh, this is our villus right here. And then these are the enterocytes that are forming that epithelial lining of the villus. Um, and you can again see that kind of fuzzy purplish or pinkish on the surface, which is the brush border right there. Um, and so this is a very nice clean micrograph and you can also clearly see the nuclei. And then you can see the structure inside here, which would be those lacteals and capillaries and other stuff within that villus. If we look at the duodenum proper, we can now see this is the lumen of the tubule right here. And then this is the mucosa layer, the submucosa and the muscularis. So this is classic muscle. And so what you can see is I've highlighted right here, the submucosal layer. And you can see within the submucosal layer are these Br Brunner's glands, which have this very classic tube-like structure. When we And then when we cut it, uh, because it's a lot of these tubes or glands, uh, they look like circles in the micrograph. And so these Brunner's glands are really specialized for producing that alkaline mucus. And then the glands have ducts that run through the mucosa and then release stuff into the lumen proper. And here you can see kind of remains of the villi, but it's not quite as clean as this image. In addition to receiving uh, that chyme from the stomach, the duodenum is also receiving secretions both from the pancreas in the form of enzymes and also from the liver and the gallbladder in the form of bile. Um, and so there are specialized ducts that are releasing those secretions into the duodenum. The next part of the small intestine or the second segment after this purple duodenum is kind of this teal or bluish jejunum. So this is also a major site for nutrient absorption. It's also involved in chemical digestion, but not as much as the duodenum. So there are still enzymes here that are breaking food down, but for instance, there aren't secretions from the pancreas adding enzymes, although those enzymes are still going to be present in digesting, chemically digesting food as it travels through the jejunum. Um, however, there isn't as much left in the jejunum, and we'll see this trend continue. So we see fewer absorptive specializations compared with the duodenum. Um, and also because there's less food left as things are absorbed um, and there's less left over, we'll see that the jejunum has a smaller diameter and that will go smaller as we go through and it won't be as thick. I, again, there aren't those Brunner's glands and there's not as much demands on this part of the uh, intestine. Um, but there's still segmentation going on, which is mixing food and uh, mechanically breaking it down and also mixing up the enzymes from the pancreatic juices uh, with the, the food that's now in the test intestines. Finally, we have the ileum. Um, which is the third and last segment of the small intestine. And so again, this is continuing nutrient absorption, but as we get into the ileum, there's going to be less and less food. So it's going to be less nutrient absorption than the 
first two segments. And so we're going to be, see less specializations for absorption and even smaller diameter. The other thing that really differentiates the ilium, at least the later parts of the ilium, uh, compared to the earlier parts of the small intestine, the duodenum and the jun junum, is the presence of these Pierre's patches, um, which are effectively immune outposts. So if you'll remember from the lymphatic system, we uh, talked about the malt tissue or the mucosa associated lymphatic tissue. And so Pierre's patches are examples of malt. Um, and so they're little immune outposts. And so why in the ilium, and not earlier on. Well, there's lots of bacteria in your large intestine, um, which are kind of receiving whatever remains of the food. And those bacteria serve an important role in terms of digestion and also uh, absorption of certain vitamins. But there are also bacteria that are potentially dangerous to us. And so um, the ileum, because it's interacting with the large intestine, which uh, is where there are going to be bacteria present, has these specialized immune outposts, um, which will kind of interact um, and protect the intestine from the presence of those bacteria and can help keep the bacteria under control in the small intestine. So the other thing I'll just note about bacteria is they want food, right? So if bacteria can get carbohydrates and proteins or amino acids from your gut, they will. And so the body effectively wants to kill these bacteria because in the small intestines, the body's still capturing as much of this food as possible. Whereas when it gets into the large intestines, it's mostly absorbed all of the nutrients um, and most of the minerals and vitamins with a few exceptions. And so mainly what's left is water. Um, and so in the large intestine, the body doesn't care as much if there's bacteria because they're not competing for food because hopefully all of the key things the body needs have already been absorbed in the small intestine. Let's talk a little bit more about these digestive processes that are occurring in the duodenum and how the accessory organs play key roles in these digestive processes. So as a reminder, the accessory organs I've highlighted are the liver, so this large kind of reddish brown structure, the gallbladder, the green structure, which is green because of the color, the greenish color of bile. Um, and then finally, the pancreas you can see right here. And then this is the segment of the duodenum right here. And so note that we have this bile duct, which is projecting and releasing secretions into the duodenum. And then there's also a pancreatic duct. And this is just a different, more simplified image. And you can kind of see where everything is located uh, at the level of the whole body. So we have these different structures and then we can see the spleen right here. Let's start with the pancreas and its role as an accessory organ. So as I mentioned earlier, this pancreas is primarily involved in producing digestive enzymes, which are involved in chemical digestion. Um, and so the bulk of cells in the pancreas are called these acinar cells, um, and they produce these water-soluble enzymes. So they're going to mix with the intestinal juices um, and these enzyme precursors, which are called zymogens. And so if you think of enzyme, we have the zyme here and gens. So enzymes are generated from these zymogens. So um, it's a clever, maybe nerdy biologist naming system. Okay, so here we can see the kind of cartoon diagram of the cells within the pancreas. So you'll note that we have these circular structures. So these are the acinar cells. Um, and so these are creating, these are parts of glands. So these acinar cells are producing secretions and uh, releasing them into these ducts. Um, and then these ducts eventually collect into a very large pancreatic duct, which then uh, combines with a duct from the liver and then releases the secretions from the pancreas into the duodenum. Okay, so one of the key uh, types of enzymes that are produced by the pancreas are these proteases. Um, and so the first one I really wanna highlight um, is this trypsinogen. So as a reminder, proteases are enzymes that break down proteins. So they're breaking amino acid bonds and there's lots of different amino acids. And so usually we need different enzymes to break different bonds between different amino acids. So the specific one we're going to focus on is trypsinogen or start with, uh, which is the zymogen or inactive form of trypsin, which is the protease. So trypsin, when it's active, will start breaking 
uh, atomic bonds between amino acids and breaking down proteins into smaller polypeptides, um, which are just chains of amino acids. So um, you can see here that I showed this inactive trypsinogen in the pancreas right here. So this is the zymogen, and it's released through the from the eosinophil cells into the pancreatic duct and goes into the duodenum. So once it's in the duodenum, remember trypsinogen is inactive, so it can't do any cleavage, but it interacts with this enteropepsidase, which is part of the brush border cells. So this is one of those enzymes I talked about earlier um, that's on the uh, microvilli of the enterocytes. And so this enteropeptidase actually cleaves this uh, peptide off the trypsinogen and produces the active version or the trypsin, which itself is an enzyme, which can then start breaking down proteins itself. So the enteropeptidase is the important key initial reaction. And as more trypsinogen is released, it's going to get cleaved and produce this active trypsin protease. Trypsin can not only break down proteins that are uh, in the food that's being released into the small intestine, but it can also cleave other trypsinogen molecules. So effectively, we get this positive feedback loop. Trypsinogen is released. It, uh, there's a cleavage by or activation by enteropeptidase, which produces trypsin, which can then go and activate more trypsin by uh, activating trypsinogen. So we get this positive feedback loop where um, the enzymes can get in here and very quickly interact. And I'll just mention, um, because I didn't mention it earlier um, in this lecture, that the reason we want these zymogen versions of the enzymes is we don't want the enzyme active in the pancreas proper, because if we have proteases in the pancreas, there's lots of proteins in your cells and on the surface of your cells. So the trypsinogen will actually start chemically digesting your own cells. And in fact, uh, this is what we see with pancreatitis is if you have a bunch of these pancreatic enzymes build up in your pancreas because the duct is blocked or something, your pancreas will effectively start digesting itself, which as you can imagine is really bad. And so one of the controls on that is that this enteropeptidase is uh, helps assist in activating this trypsinogen. Um, but any having an active form of the enzyme is potentially dangerous, and sometimes you can get active forms that build up in the pancreas. Another pancreatic enzyme is this chymotrypsinogen, which is the inactive zymogen form, which is released from the pancreas. Again, when it gets into the duodenum, um, it's going to be converted into its active form, chemo chymotrypsin, which again is activated by, by trypsin itself. So trypsin activates chymotrypsin. Um, so now we have another protease in here, which is going to target different uh, amino acid, amino acid bonds. Another one, and you'll notice a trend here, is this procarboxypeptidase. It's breaking peptide bonds. So maybe working with smaller fragments of proteins and breaking them down into smaller amino acid components. And then the active form is the carboxypeptidase, which again, the procarboxypeptidase is activated by trypsin through that cleavage. So that's just the example of the proteases. Um, which are these zymogens and activate or break down proteins. Note that there are enzymes that are released by the pancreas that basically break down any type of macronutrient. So amylases, which are targeting carbohydrates, lipases, which are uh, breaking down lipids, and nucleases, which are breaking down nucleic acids. And note this A's at the end, which is indicating that they're enzymes. And then the... Uh, the prefix is telling you what type of thing it is breaking down, whether it's a protein, a carbohydrate, a lipid, or a nucleic acid. So those are the enzymes and enzyme precursors that are produced by the pancreas and released. But the pancreas is also involved in neutralizing this chyme, which is coming from the, uh, from the stomach. Um, and so it does that through this release of bicarbonate. So as a reminder, carbo carbon dioxide is uh, combines with water to form carbonic acid, which dissociates into bicarbonate and hydrogen ion. So these ductal cells will actively pull bicarbonate from the blood, um, and then they can release that blood into the ducts of the pancreas while the protons or doing something else in the bloodstream or in the ductal cells. And so as that bicarbonate is flowing in, it makes this internal uh, duct, 
uh, within the pancreas more and more alkaline, which is going to be higher pH, more basic. Um, so these digestive enzymes are being released and then the bicarbonate is being combined with them. And so that combined then helps neutralize the stomach acid that's coming in. And so here you can also see again, another example of the uh, arrangement of the acinar cells. They're forming this large kind of nodule um, or duct of your gland here, and they're releasing those digestive, uh, ion, digestive enzymes and also protons. And then the protons uh, and digestive ions are flowing down uh, and being moved and bicarbonate is being actively secreted here. And then ultimately it's the bicarbonate which is released into the duodenum. Now let's shift to the other two accessory organs, the liver and the gallbladder. Um, and so these are specialized for producing or secreting, uh, producing and or secreting bile salts into the duodenum via these bile ducts. So the liver is actually the organ that produces bile. Um, and so you can see these bile ducts coming from this kind of purplish liver right here. And then you can see the gallbladder, which is kind of hanging out by the liver here. And it's this green and it's a sac-like sac structure. So the gallbladder doesn't produce bile, but it recycles and stores bile and then releases it back into the intestine. So the liver is what produces bile. And so let's look at kind of the structure of the liver. So if we zoom in on the liver and take a histological section, we can see that uh, the liver is composed of these hepatic lobules here. Um, and so there are these hexagonal structures. So one, two, three, four, five, six uh, sides and hexagonal structures form kind of this optimal packing uh, within different uh, surfaces. Um, in, in the center of this hexagon right here uh, is this central venule, venule. So this is going to be a vein that's collecting stuff. And we can see uh, that we have these portal triads, which are composed of three different vessels. We have our bile duct, or I guess a duct, and then we have our portal vein and our hepatic arterial. So the hepatic arterial is going to be carrying blood in. The portal venule is going to be uh, carrying uh, so hepatic arterial is carrying blood from circulation with the oxygen into the hepatic lobule. The portal vein, as a reminder, is carrying blood from the intestines um, into the liver, and then eventually it will uh, collect in the central venule and go back to circulation, and then this bile duct is kind of running parallel. And so what we have here in this lobule are all of these individual hepatocytes, and these hepatocytes are helping to produce uh, bile and releasing it into these bile ducts, which are collecting and going kind of backwards the opposite direction of these portal veins because the portal veins are coming from the intestines and so the bile ductule and eventually the duct wants to go the opposite direction and go to the small intestine. So the liver produces the bile and then the gallbladder stores and recycles the bile. So one of the things to note is that occasionally there are toxic substances that are in your gut which are lipophilic. So if they're lipophilic they like to uh, kind of collect and mix with nonpolar compounds. And I'll, I'll talk about this in a moment, but bile is there to uh, emulsify fat. And so it's amphiopathic, kind of like a phospholipid. And so it's really interacting with those nonpolar things. And so sometimes uh, an issue that can happen is that uh, toxic substances get reabsorbed along with the bile. So we can see that we have these bile salts that are released into the duodenum, and then they kind of go through and they go all the way down to the ileum. And then as they get to the ileum, they're reabsorbed back into the body and returned to the liver via the portal system. And then those bile salts are then transported back to the duct system and can be stored in the gallbladder, which can release them later. So remember, you're not always digesting stuff. So sometimes you don't want that bile actively circulating in your gut. And so that's where the gallbladder can help store it. Um, but if there are substances that are toxic, that are lipophilic, they can kind of follow that bile back into the body and into the liver and cause problems. So as bile is released from both the gallbladder and the liver, it forms this common bile duct, common between the gallbladder and the liver. And that common bile duct eventually uh, meets with the pancreatic duct, which forms the hepato, the liver, pancreatic, pancreas, ampulla, slash duct. Um, and so that name is very obvious, which is 
the one I like because it explains what it is, a combination of the liver bile duct and the pancreatic duct, um, which is then releasing stuff into the duodenum, duodenum but that's also, also called the ampulo, ampulla of water. I'm probably mispronouncing that. So what do bile salts do? They are not chemically digesting stuff. Rather, they're mechanically breaking down lipids via this process of emulsification. So note this uh, magenta up here, this square, and I really want to emphasize this bile is mechanically breaking down lipids. It's making them into smaller separate molecules, but it's not breaking chemical bonds. And so bile achieves this because it's amphipathic, like I mentioned earlier, it's polar and nonpolar, just like phospholipids. So here we can see the chemical structure of bile. And so I'm just highlighting this here that we have uh, this steroid part, which is nonpolar, and then we have a conjugated amino acid, which is polar, and that forms our bile salt right here. So just like a phospholipid, when the bile salt, which has this polar head and nonpolar tail, mixes uh, with fat, what happens is these nonpolar tails interact with the fat, and the polar heads interact with the water, and so they effectively surround the fats. So here you can see a larger fat droplet and then these smaller micelles. So if we have our oil slash fat and water, these don't mix because of the nonpolar interactions. And so as stuff is mechanically broken down and mixed in the gut, it will form these small fat drop, uh, uh, droplets um, and mix that fat in with the water. And then effectively these bile salts can mix with them to form the micelles. And so that creates these smaller structures, these smaller spheres. So note that this oil and fat, if our enzymes are in the water, they can only interact with the fat at the surface. Uh, and in order to keep them in this drop like for a format or structure in the water, they really need something to stabilize them, which are going to be the bile salts. And so now each of these spheres is fully interacting with the water and we have more surface area and more potential for interaction with the enzymes in the gut. And also these fats are just smaller and smaller packages, so they can be more easily absorbed through the gut wall. And again, remember that uh, nonpolar substances have an easier time being absorbed because they can interact with that uh, nonpolar region of the plasma membrane because the plasma membrane is also composed of amphipathic substances, i.e. phospholipids. So again, it's a mechanical breakdown. It's not chemically digesting the fats or breaking atomic bonds. It's just forming smaller droplets. So in conclusion, we've talked about the small intestine and its role in uh, chemically digesting and absorbing nutrients that have been transported from the stomach. Um, and so uh, the, the small intestine is composed of the duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum. Um, and then the duodenum in particular receives secretions from both the pancreas and the liver and the gallbladder. And then all of those different secretions combine with the cells within the small intestine proper, specifically those uh, enterocytes, which have the brush border enzymes, to break down um, the con or, or the food that is coming uh, into the duodenum. And so both chemical digestion from the pancreatic and intestinal enzymes, and also mechanical breakdown of fats via the bile released from the liver and the gallbladder. Um, and so those mixed together, and then as they're broken down into their smallest components, right here, this little blue hexagon here, those can be absorbed from the lumen of the intestine into the body, into the bloodstream, and circulated into the body proper where they can be used by cells. Um, and so really it's the com combined uh, efforts of both the small intestine and the accessory organs that completes the digestion of macronutrients so they can be absorbed into the body.